from around the globe. It's theCUBE, with digital coverage of Exascale Day, made possible by Hewlett Packard Enterprise. We're back at the celebration of Exascale Day. This is Dave Vellante, and I'm pleased to welcome two great guests. Brian Dansbury is here. He's with the ISS Program Science Office at the Johnson Space Center. And Dr. Mark Fernandez is back. He's the America's HPC Technology Officer at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. To be here. Thank you. Yeah, well, thanks for coming on. And Mark, good to see you again. And, and Brian, I wonder if we could start with you and talk a little bit about your role as, uh, at the ISS Program Science Office as a scientist. What's happening these days? What are you working on? Well, it, it, it's been my privilege the last few years to be working in the uh, uh, research integration area of, of the space station office. And that's where we're looking at all of the different sponsors, NASA, the, the other international partners, all the sponsors within NASA and, and uh, prioritizing what research gets to go up to station, what research gets conducted in, in, in that regard. And to give you a feel for the, um, the magnitude of the task, but we're coming up now on November 2nd for the 20th anniversary of continuous human presence on station. So we've been a spacefaring society now for coming up on 20 years. And, and I always like to point out because, uh, you know, it, as an old guy myself, it, 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 it impresses me. That's, you know, that's 25% of the U.S. population. Everybody under the age of 20 has never had a moment when they were alive where we didn't have people living and working in space. So, okay, I got off on a tangent there. We'll move on. In that 20 years, we've done 3,000 experiments on station. And the station has really made a, a miraculous sort of evolution from a basic platform to what is now really a fully functioning national lab up there with um, commercially run research facilities all the time. Uh, think You can think of it as the world's largest uh, satellite bus. We have you know, four or five instruments looking down, measuring uh, all kinds of things in, in the atmosphere during Earth observation data, looking out, doing astrophysics research, measuring cosmic rays, X-ray uh, observatory, all kinds of things. Plus, inside the station, you've got racks and racks of experiments going on, typically scores, you know, if not more than 50 experiments going on at any one time. So, you know, the topic of, of this event is, is really important to us at NASA, you know, data transmission up and down, all of the cameras going on on, on station, the, the experiments, um, you know, one of, one of those astrophysics observatories, you know, is, has collected over 15 billion um, uh, impact data of cosmic rays. And so the massive amounts of data that, that needs to be collected and transferred for all of these experiments to go on really hits to the core. And, and I'm glad I'm able to, to be here and, and speak with you today on this, this topic. Well, thank you for that, Brian. And of course, as, as a baby boomer, right? I grew up mm -hmm. with the national pride of the moon landing. And of course, we've, we, we've seen, we saw the space shuttle, we've seen international collaboration, and it's just it's always been something, you know, part of our lives. So thank you for the great work that you guys are doing there. Uh, Mark, you and I had a great discussion about exascale and kind of what it means for society and some of the innovations that we can maybe expect o over the coming years. But I wonder if you could talk about some of the collaboration between what you guys are doing and Brian's team. Uh, yeah, so yes, indeed. Thank you for having me, I really appreciate it. And that was a great introduction, Brian. Uh, I'm the principal investigator on Spaceborne Computer 2, and as the two implies, well, there was one before it. And so we worked with Brian and his team uh, extensively over the past few years to get high-performance computing on board the International Space Station. Brian mentioned uh, thousands of experiments that have been done to date and that there are currently 50 or more going on at any one time. And those experiments collect data. And uh, up until recently, you've had to transmit that data down to earth for processing. And that's a significant amount of bandwidth. <clears throat> so with Spaceborne and Computer 2, we're inviting Halo developers and others to take advantage of that onboard computational capabilities. Uh, you mentioned Exascale. We plan to get to Exascale next year. We're currently in the era that's called Petascale. Uh, and we've been in the Petascale era since 2007. So it's taken us a while to make that next leap. 
Well, 10 years after Earth had a petascale system in 2017, we were able to put uh, a teraflop system on the International Space Station to prove that we could do a trillion calculations a second in space. That's where the data is originating. That's where it might be best to process it. So we want to be able to take those capabilities with us. And with HPE acting as a wonderful partner with uh, Brian and NASA and the space station, we think we'll be able to do that for many of these experiments. It's mind boggling you know, when you think we were talking about, I was talking about the moon landing earlier and, and the, the limited power of you know, computing power. And now we've got you know, water cooled supercomputers in space. I, I'm, I'm interested, I'd love to explore this notion of private industry developing space capable computers. I think it's an interesting model where you have you know, computer companies can repurpose technology that they're selling you know, at obviously greater scale for space ex exploration and apply that supercomputing technology, instead of having government fund proprietary purpose-built systems that are essentially uni-use uni case, if you will. So Brian, what are the benefits of that model uh, that perhaps you wouldn't achieve with, with governments or maybe contractors, you know, kind of building these proprietary uh, systems? Well, first of all, you know, any, any tool you're using, any, any new technology that has, you know, multiple users, is going to mature quicker. You're going to have the, you know greater features, greater capabilities. You know, not even talking about computers. Anything you're doing. So moving from you know governor government as a single um, you know user to off the shelf type products gives you that opportunity to have things that have been proven. Have the the technology is fully matured. Now what had to happen is we had to mature the space station so that we had a platform where we could test these things and make sure they're going to work in the high radiation environment, you know, and they're going to be reliable because first you've got to make sure that that safety and reliability are taken care of. So that, that, that's why in the space program, you're going to, you're going to be behind the times in terms of the computing power of, of the equipment up there. Because first of all, and, and foremost, you needed to make sure that it was reliable and safe. Now, my undergraduate degree was in aerospace engineering. And what we care about as aerospace engineers is how heavy is it, how big and bulky is it? Because, you know, it's it's expensive. You know, every pound, uh, I, I once visited uh, Gulfstream Aerospace and they would pay their employees $1,000 if they could come up with a way of saving one pound in building that aircraft. That means you have more capacity for flying. It's only orders of magnitude more important to do that when you're taking payloads to space. So. You know, particularly with spaceborne computer, the, the opportunity there to use software and, and check the reliability that way uh, without having to make the computer, you know, radiation resistant, if you will, with heavy, you know, bulky um, packaging to protect it from that radiation is a really important thing. And it's going to be a huge advantage moving forward as we go to the moon and on to Mars. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, your point about uh, COTS, commercial off the, the shelf te technology. I mean, that's something that obviously governments have wanted to leverage for a long, long time, for many, many decades. But, but, but Mark, the, the, the issue was always the, as Brian was just saying, the very str stringent and str difficult requirements of space. It's obviously with Spaceborne One, you got to the point where you had visibility, the economics made sense it made commercial sense for companies like Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and now we've sort of closed that gap to the point where you're sort of now on that innovation curve. Maybe I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Brian has some excellent points. You know, he said, anything we do today requires computers, and that's absolutely correct. So I tell people that when you go to the moon and when you go to the Mars, you probably want to go with the iPhone 10 or 11 and not a flip phone. So before Spaceborne was sent up, you went with 2000, early 2000s computing technology there, which like you said, many of the people born today weren't even around when the space station began and has been occupied. So they don't even know how to program or use that type of computing power. With Spaceborne One, we sent the exact same products that we were shipping to customers today. So they are current state of the art. And we had a mandate, don't touch the hardware, have all the protection that you can via software. 
And so that's what we've done. We've got several philosophical ways to do that. We've implemented those in software. They've been successful and proven in Spaceborn 1. And now in Spaceborn 2, we're going to begin the experiments so that the rest of the community can so that the rest of the community can figure out that it is economically viable and it will accelerate their research and progress in space. So I'm most excited about that. Uh, every venture into space, as, as Brian mentioned, will require some computational capability and HPE has figured out that the economics are there and we need to bring the customers to Spaceborne 2 in order for them to learn that we are all reliable but current state of the art and that we can benefit them and all of humanity. Guys, I want to ask you kind of a two part question and Brian, I'll start with you. And it's, it's somewhat philosophical. Uh, I mean, my understanding was, and I, and I want to say this was probably around the time of the Bush administration, W2, uh, and, and maybe certainly before that, but as technology progressed, there was a debate about, all right, should we put our resources on moon because of the proximity to earth or should we, you know, go where you know, no man has gone before and, or woman and get to Mars. Um, where, what's the thinking today, Brian, on, on that, that balance between Moon and Mars? Well, you know, it, it, our plans today are, are to get back to the Moon by 2024. That's the, the Artemis program. Uh, it's exciting. It, it makes sense from, uh, you know, an engineering standpoint, you take, you know, you take baby steps as you continue to move forward. And so you have that opportunity um, to to learn while you're still you know relatively close to home. You can get there in 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 days, not months. If you're going to Mars, for example, uh, to have everything line up properly, you're looking at a multi-year mission. You know, it may take you nine months to get there. Then you have to wait for the Earth and Mars to get back in the right position to come back on that same kind of trajectory. So you have to be there for more than a year before you can turn around and come back. So, you know, it, he was talking about the computing power. You know, right now, the, the beautiful thing about the space station is it's right there, it's, it's orbiting above us, it's only 250 miles away. Uh, so you can test out all of these technologies. You can uh, rely on the ground to keep track of systems. There's not that much of a delay in terms of the telemetry coming back. But as you get to the moon, and then definitely as you get it, get out to Mars, you know there are enough minutes delay out there that you've got to take the computing power with you. You've got to take everything you need to be able to make those decisions you need to make, because there's not time to, um, you know, get that information back on the ground, get back, get it back to Earth, have people analyze the situation, and then tell you what the next step is to do. That may be too late. So you've got to take the computing power with you. So exascale maybe brings some new possibilities, uh, both. Both for you know the Moon and Mars. I know Spaceborne One did some s simulations uh, relative to, to Mars. We'll talk about that. But but Brian, what are the things that you hope to get out of exascale you know computing that maybe you, you couldn't do with previous generations? Well, you know, you know, Mark hit on a key point. You know, bandwidth up and down is is of course always a limitation, and the more uh, computing data analysis you can do on site the more efficient you can be with parsing out that, that bandwidth. And to give you a feel uh, for just that kind of thing, think about those, those observatories, Earth observing and, and astronomical, I was talking about collecting data. Think about the hours of video that are being recorded daily as the astronauts work on various things to document what they're doing. The, many of the biological experiments, one of the key, key pieces of data that's coming back is that video of the the uh, microbes growing or the plants growing or whatever fluid physics experiments going on. We do a lot of colloids research, which is suspended particles inside a liquid. And that of course, high speed video is key to, to doing that kind of research. Right now we've got uh, something called the ISS experience going on in there, which is basically recording and, and will eventually put out a series of, of basically a movie on uh, it's a virtual reality recording. That kind of data is, is so huge when you have a 360 degree camera up there recording all of that data to create virtual reality. They, there's still a lot of times bringing that back on higher hard drives, but when the SpaceX vehicles come back to the Earth, that's a lot of data going on. We record 8K videos all the time. Tremendous amount of bandwidth going on. And as you get to the moon and as you get further out, you can imagine how much more limiting that bandwidth is. 
Yeah, we used to joke in the old, the old mainframe days that the fastest way to get data from point A to point B was called CTAM, the Chevy truck access method. You just load up a truck with whatever it was, tapes or hard drives. So, and, yeah. and so, yeah. and, and Mark, uh, of course, Spaceborne 2 was coming, uh, and Spaceborne 1 really was a, a pilot, but it proved that that commercial computers could actually work for long durations in space, yeah. and the the economics were feasible. Uh, yeah. But thinking about mm -hmm. you know future missions in Spaceborne 2, what are you hoping to accomplish? I'm hoping to bring <clears throat> I'm hoping to bring that success from Spaceborne 1 to the rest of the community with Spaceborne 2 so that they can realize they can do their processing at the edge. The purpose of exploration is insight, not data collection. So all of these experiments begin with data collection, whether that's videos or samples or mold growing, et cetera, collecting that data, we must process it to turn it into information and insight. And the faster we can do that, the, the faster we get our results and the, and the better things are. I often talk to uh, college and high school and sometimes grammar school students about this need to process at the edge and how the communication issues can prevent you from doing that. For example, uh, many of us remember uh, the communications with the moon. The moon is about 250,000 miles away, if I remember correctly, and the speed of light is 186,000 miles a second. So even at the speed of light, it takes more than a second for the communications to get to the moon and back. So I can remember being stressed out when Houston would make a statement and we were wondering if the astronauts could answer. Well, they answered as soon as possible, but that one to two second delay that was natural was what drove us crazy, which made us nervous. We were worried about them and the success of the mission. So. Mars is millions of miles away. So flip it around. If, if you're uh, a, a Mars explorer and you look out the window and there's a big red cloud coming at you that looks like a tornado, and you might want to do some Mars dust storm modeling right then and there to figure out what's the safest thing to do. You don't have the time, literally, to get that back to Earth, have them process it, and get you the answer back. You've got to take those computational capabilities with you, and we're hoping that of these 50 to thousands of experiments that are on board the ISS can show that in order to better accomplish their missions on the moon and on Mars. I'm so glad you brought that up because I was going to ask you guys. In the commercial world, everybody talks about you know real time. Uh, so of course, we talk about the real time edge and AI inferencing and and the, and the time value of data. I, I was going to ask, you know, the real timeness, how do you handle that? And I think Mark, you just answered that. But at the same time, people will say in, you know, the commercial world, like for instance, in advertising, you know, the, the joke, the best, it's not kind of a joke, but the best minds of our generation are trying to get people to click on ads. And it's somewhat true, unfortunately. But, but at any rate, the value of data diminishes over time. I would imagine in space exploration where where you're dealing in things like light years that actually there's quite a bit of value in, in the historical data. But Mark, you just, you just gave a great example of where you need real time compute capabilities on the ground. But, but Brian, I wonder if I could ask you, the value of this histor historical data as you, you just described collecting so much data, uh, are you, do you see that the value of that data actually persists over time and you can go back with with, with better modeling and, and, and better AI and computing and actually learn from all that data. What are your thoughts on that, Brian? I, I, definitely, I think the answer is yes to that. And you know, as part of the evolution from, uh, from basically a platform to, to a station, we're also learning to make use of the experiments and the data that we have there. Um, NASA has set up um, you know, an, an open data access sites for some of our physical science experiments that have taken place there and, and gene lab for, for looking at some of the biological uh, genomic experiments that have gone on. And I've seen papers uh, already beginning to be generated, not from the original experimenters and, and, and principal investigators, but from that um, data set that, that has been collected. And, you know, wh when you're sending something up to space and, and, and it, it to the space station and, and uh, volume for cargo is so limited, you want to get the most you can out of that. 
So you you want to be as efficient as possible, and, and one of the ways you do that is you collect, you take these Earth observing uh, mm -hmm. instruments, and you take that data. And sure, the principal investigators are using it for the key thing that they designed it for. But if that data is available, others will come along and make use of it in different ways. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I, I want to remind the audience: so these 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 are supercomputers, these space-borne computers. They're they're solar powered, obviously, and and they're mounted. Overhead, right? Uh, is that is that correct? Yes, uh, spaceborne computer was mounted in the overhead. Uh, I jokingly say that as uh, soon as someone can figure out how to get a data center uh, in orbit, they will have a 50% denser data station than we can have down here. Instead of two rows side by side, you can also have one overhead, uh, and the power is free if you can drive it off of solar. And the cooling is free because it's pretty cold out there in space. So it's going to be very efficient. Uh, Spaceborne computer is the most energy efficient computer in existence. Uh, free electricity and free cooling. And now we're offering free cycles to all the experimenters on board. Yeah, so Spaceborne 1 exceeded its mission time frame. You were able to run, as I was mentioned before, some simulations for future Mars missions. And, yes. um, and you talked a little bit about w what you want to get out of uh, Spaceborne 2. I, I mean, are there other like wish list items, uh, bucket bucket list items that that, <laughs> that people are talking about? Yeah, uh, two of them, and 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 these are kind of hypothetical. And, and Brian kind of alluded to them. Uh, one is uh, having the the data on board. So an example that a payload developers talked to us about is, uh, hey, I'm on Mars and I, I see this mold growing on my potato. That's not good. So let me let me sample that uh, mold, do a gene sequencing, and then I've got stored all the historical data on Spaceborne Computer of all the bad molds out there, and let me do a comparison right then and there before I have dinner with my fried potatoes. So that's that's one that's very interesting. Uh, a second one closer related to it is we have offered up the storage on Spaceborne Computer Two for all of your raw data that we process. So Mr. Scientist, if, if you need the raw data and you need it now, of course you can have it sent down, but if you don't, let us just hold it there as long as we have space. And when we return to earth, like you mentioned, Patrick, we'll ship that solid state disk back to them so they can have it in person. But again, reserving that network bandwidth, uh, keeping all that raw data available for the entire duration of the mission so that it may have value later on. Great, thank you for that. I, I want to end on just sort of talking about, if you come back to the collaboration between ISS National Labs and, and Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and you've got, you're inviting project ideas using Spaceborne 2 during the upcoming yeah. mission. Maybe you could talk about uh, what that's about. And we have a, we have a graphic we're going to put up and, and some information that you can, you can access, but uh, please, uh, Mark, share with us what you're planning there. So again, the collaboration has been outstanding. There, there's been a mention of how much savings is uh, if you can reduce a weight by a pound. Well, our partners, ISS National Lab and NASA have, have taken on that cost of delivering spaceborne computer to the International Space Station as part of their collaboration and powering and cooling us and giving us the technical support. Uh, in return on our side, we're offering up spaceborne computer two for all the onboard experiments and, and all those that think they might be wanting to do an experiment on spaceborne uh, on the ISS in the future to take advantage of that. So we're very, very excited about that. Yeah, and you can go to uh, just email spaceborne at hpe.com uh, and Correct. just float some ideas. Uh, I, I'm sure at some point there'll be a website so you can email them or you can email me, yes. david.vellante at, at siliconangle.com and I'll shoot you that, that email one, or that website once we get it. Uh, but Brian, I want to end with you. You've been so gracious with your time. Uh, you, you know, give us your final thoughts on, on Exascale, maybe how you're celebrating Exascale Day. I was joking with Mark, maybe we get a special Exascale drink for uh, 1018, but uh, <laughs> your, what are your final thoughts, uh, Brian? <laughs> Yeah, yeah I, I, I'm going to digress just a little bit. I think I, I think I have a unique perspective to celebrate Exascale Day because, uh, as an undergraduate student, I was uh, interning at Langley Research Center in the wind tunnels, 
Oh, and uh, the, the, the wind good. tunnel I was in, um, they, they, they were very excited that they had a new uh, state-of-the-art giant room-sized computer to take that data. We, we, we worked on unsteady um, aerodynamic forces, so you need a lot of computation and you need to be able to take data at a, at a high bandwidth to be able to do that. They'd always you know, run their, their wind tunnel for four or five hours, almost a whole shift collect that data and maybe a week later been able to look at the data to decide if they got what they were looking for. Well, at the time in the in the early 80s, this is definitely the before times that I got there, they had uh, they, they had that computer in place. Yes, it was a punch card computer. It was the one time in my life I got to put my hands on the punch cards and was told not to drop them. I would get in trouble if I did that. But I was able to immediately after, or actually during their run, take that data reduce it down, grab my colored pencils uh, and some graph paper and graph out the um, coefficient of lift, coefficient of drag, other things that they were measuring, take it back to them. And they were so excited to have data two hours after they had taken it, analyzed and looked at that, that it just tickled them think that they could make decisions now on what they wanted to do for their next run. Well, we've come a long way since then. You know, Exascale Day really, really emphasizes that point, you know? So it really brings it home to me. Yeah. But, you know, please. Go ahead. No, please. Carry on. Well, I, I was just going to say, you know, you've talked about the, the opportunities that, that Spaceborne Computer provides, and, and, and Mark mentioned our, our colleagues at the ISS National Lab. You know, um, the, the, the space station has been declared a national laboratory, and so about half of the uh, capabilities we have for doing research is, is apportioned to the national lab so that commercial entities so that the HPE can can do these sorts of projects and, and universities can access the station and, and other government agencies and, and then NASA can focus in on those things we want to do purely uh, to push our exploration programs. So the opportunities to take advantage of that are there. Mark's opening up the door for a lot of opportunities, but, but others can just Google ISS National Laboratory and find some information on how to get in the way Mark did originally using ISS National Lab to maybe get a good experiment up there. Mm -hmm. Well, it's just astounding to see the progress that this industry has made when you go back and look at the, you know, the early days of supercomputing to imagine that they actually can be space-borne is, is just tremendous. Uh, not, and not only the impacts that it can have on space ex exploration, but also society in general. Mark, we, we talked about that. Guys, thanks so much for coming on theCUBE and celebrating uh, Exascale Day and helping uh, expand the community. Great work and, uh, and, and thank you very much for all that you guys do. Thank you very much for having me on and, and everybody out there. Let's get to Exoscale as quick as we can. Appreciate everything y'all are doing. Let's do it. Hey right. Brian, I've got, a, I've got a similar story. Humanity saw the first trillion calculations per second, like I said, in uh, 1997, and it was over a hundred racks of computer equipment. Well, Spaceborne One is less than fourth of a rack in only 20 years. So I'm going to be celebrating Exascale Day in anticipation of Exascale computers on Earth and soon following within the national lab that exists in 20 plus years and being on Mars. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> Mark, thank you for that. And, and thank you for watching everybody. We're celebrating Exascale Day with the community, the supercomputing community on theCUBE. Right back.